What is a medieval English baron doing in the United States House of Representatives? That's this week on Footnoting History. Hey, this is Christine, and today I want to introduce you to Simon de Montfort. Simon was the first English baron to lead a rebellion that called for representational government. To our European listeners, his name might already be familiar, but if you grew up in the United States, there's a good chance that your school skipped this one. I happen to truly love Simon's life story. You might even say I have a bit of a crush on him. I once did a trip through the English Midlands just so I could see where he died. I still remember sitting on the grass and imagining what it must have been like for him. My friend Laura thought I was strange, but she humored me anyway, so I will always appreciate that. Thanks, Laura. It wasn't until later that I learned Simon wasn't entirely unknown back at home. It turns out there's a marble relief of him in the United States House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. For anyone who is questioning my use of the term relief, imagine the profile you see on the side of a coin, make it out of marble, and blow it up to be much larger, kind of like a giant plaque. He appears alongside 22 other historical figures like Thomas Jefferson. These men, yes, they're all men, were chosen for their work establishing the laws and principles that influenced and underlie the tenets of American law. So let's say one day you're in the House of Representatives. You see this relief up on the wall with all those other more recognizable people. You may not even notice him, but if you do, you might ask yourself, who is this guy with the long hair, beard, and the aquiline nose? To figure that out, we'll break it into three questions. One, who is Simon de Montfort? Two, what did he do that was so special? And three, what happened to him? First up, who is Simon de Montfort? Simply stated, Simon was the sixth Earl of Leicester, and he lived from approximately 1208 to 1265. Regardless of being an English noble, he wasn't actually English at all. In fact, if you listen to Nathan's podcast on the Cather heresy, you heard a bit about the Albigensian Crusade. That's the one where the Crusaders said, forget the Holy Land, let's go after people in southern France. At the head of that crusade was Simon's father, the other Simon de Montfort. Our Simon, however, only ended up an English baron through a series of quirky events, including a relative dying without an heir and being given his brother's claim to land. In Chronicles and Contemporary Letters, Simon is noted to have been well-respected for his military knowledge, as well as his fierce devotion to religion and his family. The strength he had in his convictions kind of made you either love him or hate him. Over the course of his life, it becomes clear that two of his biggest convictions were that your family needed to be provided for and your political ideals needed to be seen through to the very end. Simon was charismatic and clever, and as such, it was no surprise that once he was in England, he found himself married to a princess, Eleanor, the sister of King Henry III, and he was at the center of the circus that was court politics. Simon's marriage to Eleanor may have been politically advantageous, but they're one of those couples I really would have loved to have dinner with. This is a bit of an aside, but it needs to be said. Eleanor was as fiery as her husband. She was so fiery that in 1251, she received letters from her confessor chiding her for her aggressiveness and her penchant for foul language. Come on, tell me that wouldn't be a good night out hanging out with her. This is doubly funny because she's the same woman who, in what I imagine to be a fit of youthful fervor, took a vow of celibacy years earlier when her first husband died. Considering once she married Simon, she had a whole brood of children, I think we can safely assume that that vow didn't stick. So now we've got Simon living in England as Earl of Leicester with his wife and growing group of children. All the while, he's in the middle of court politics and also having more than a few little personal quarrels with his brother-in-law, the king. If there's something to keep in the back of your mind, it's that Simon and Henry III didn't always see eye to eye on money. So while everything that made him important was going on, just tell yourself that underscoring it was Simon and Henry's conflict over the fact that Henry severely slacked in paying money that was due to Eleanor. That said, we can get to the crux of our story, question number two. What made this guy so important? Well, to begin with, a lot of people weren't too thrilled with Henry III. Henry, as we just said, wasn't the best when it came to money. He also made a big mistake of angering all of his English barons by showing that he didn't love them quite as much as he loved his French relatives, the Lusignans. He valued them above the counsel of his countrymen, and soon the call for reforms was so large that it had to be answered. Next thing Henry III knows, it's 1258, and he's being forced to take an oath to uphold the provisions of Oxford. Our Simon was naturally one of the men who helped draw these up, 
took the same oath as the king, and then he spent the rest of his life returning to the topic to try and uphold what they stood for. The king's relatives, who were loved so much, the Lusignans, refused to take the same oath and summarily left England. I'm really thinking that not a lot of people miss them. These provisions called the king out on not doing a very good job. They called for extensive reform of the local administration on every level. They said that the barons, or magnates, should act as representatives of the realm and govern the king's choice of ministers and his direction of policies. Basically, this was meant to keep the king twiddling his thumbs, but nevertheless, for a little bit anyway, things went as planned. Reforms started, a council was set up to oversee them, and changes began to be seen at all levels, including locally where it became easier for people to raise grievances against their lords. This didn't last, though, and it's a strange tribute to Simon's influence as to why. Simon spent some time in France looking after his family's interests, and when he came back, everything was in shambles. Without him, it seemed the fervor for reform fizzled. The councils functioned less and action stalled. The reforms already in place continued, but new ones were not being implemented. To top it all off, the king went to the pope and had him absolve him of his oath to the provisions. Then he reasserted himself so that by 1261, the Council of Barons was dismissed and Henry began to undo the reforms that he had just had put in. A lot of the barons were okay with this, but the gentry, the people lower than the barons, you know, the people who actually benefited the most from these reforms, they didn't like it so much. Simon, as one of the few barons who never wavered in his devotion to the reform movement, eventually became seen as the leader of the cause. Once he returned from France, his relationship with Henry III had a great deal of ups and downs, but eventually everything deteriorated to the point where they found themselves on opposite sides of the battlefield at Luz in 1264. This wasn't a great day for the king, but it was a banner one for Simon. He captured Henry, the heir to the throne Edward, and the king's brother Richard of Cornwall. The attitude around England was that Simon's victory was divine validation of everything that he stood for, and now he was in charge. This was the first time England was under the rule of someone other than the king, in fact, someone who wasn't even a royal. He was just married to one. So how did Simon handle his newfound power? Well, he called an assembly, or a parliament, which set up a council of nine to rule the country. At the head of the council was himself, the Bishop of Chichester, and the Earl of Gloucester. In a move that shows how he felt about representational government, at the same assembly, he allowed the knights who were called from their various counties to nominate who they wanted to act as sheriffs for their own lands. This wasn't the king selecting them, the king was wallowing in captivity. This was Simon allowing representatives of the people to choose who would help govern them. It was a smack in the face to the notion of absolute power that was long held in high regard in England. We can thank Simon for getting the ball rolling on representational government. Even if you want to be a cynic and say, well, Simon was going to benefit the most from all of this. Yeah, he was. But he also gave everyone else a taste of what it felt like to have a say in what went on and have the opportunity to have their complaints heard. Simon's assemblies during this time are often called by historians de Montfort's parliaments. So if you ever hear that term being bandied about, you can thank Henry III for making people so annoyed with him that they took matters into their own hands, and above all, Simon, for stepping to the front to make sure things got done. This unfortunately brings us to the last question, what happened to Simon? Well, I would like to tell you that he ruled in blissful peace for the rest of his life, but I'm sure you can guess that wasn't the case. In fact, Simon's ending was pretty devastating. Almost as soon as he seized power, things started to go poorly for him. There was the perpetual threat of invasion of royalist supporters from France, and Edward's friends in England could still rise up against them. Not to mention, once Simon and his family began to see benefits of his position, some of his own supporters weren't too thrilled with him either. But he wasn't down for the count. What he lacked in baronial support, he more than made up for in the support of the gentry, and he did still have a very close group of friends. Soon it was summer of 1265, and Simon was in a precarious position. He still held the king captive, but not only did Lord Edward escape, he was able to rally his troops and prevent Simon from getting reinforcements. Edward pretty much forced Simon into a confrontation at Evesham on August 4, 1265. It has been recorded all over the place that when Simon realized the gravity of the situation, he addressed his men and he said, We must commend our souls to God, for our bodies are theirs. That sentence has always given me a little bit of a chill, because talk about a scary and somber moment for these men. But still, they did not surrender. The battle went as badly as Simon anticipated, and the phrase bloodbath almost doesn't do it justice. Simon died fighting on foot after he lost his mount, and the men who killed him did not do so cleanly. 
He was decapitated, and the soldiers then paraded his head around on the end of a lance in victory. Along with Simon, his eldest son Henry and most of his allies were killed. Even those who tried to flee didn't have much luck, because in order to do so, they had to cross the river, and it was universally reported that the majority of men who tried to do that drowned. Now, okay, here's the thing about medieval battles. Yes, hundreds of men often died, but what you may not realize is how few of those men were typically the leaders and the nobility. What you really want to do is capture your opponent, take him back to your camp to get ransom, or maybe use him for political negotiations. Simon was not only slain, but the pieces of his body were sent to the families of the men who were instrumental in his downfall, with his head being delivered to the wife of Roger Mortimer, who many historians believe issued the fatal blow. Lord Edward did nothing if not ensure this was the last time he would come up against Simon de Montfort. Following Simon's death, his rebellion faded, and by 1267, power was restored to Henry III. Eventually, Lord Edward inherited the crown and became King Edward I. He would go on to earn a reputation for brutal treatment of his enemies. Funnily enough, in one of those you-can't-make-this-stuff-up moments, King Edward I also has a relief in the U.S. House of Representatives. He is there for, wait for it, calling a parliament and developing the model for it. Yes, the very king who led the charge to kill Simon was now calling a representational parliament himself. I, for one, hope that their reliefs aren't next to each other, but if they are, I like to think that Simon is giving him the evil eye. You know, there's also a really fascinating footnote to this story. That's right, here on Footnoting History, I've just managed to add a footnote to the story. This one is about two of Simon and Eleanor's sons, Simon the Younger and Guy. In 1271, the brothers were in Viterbo, located in modern-day Italy, where they murdered their cousin, Henry of Alamein, in cold blood while he was attending Mass. You see, Henry's father was Richard of Cornwall, the king's brother, the one that Simon captured who had taken part later in Simon's death. Well, it was a misguided act of revenge. The two men were obviously hurting, but something tells me that the incredibly religious Simon wouldn't have approved of their actions. If you ever find yourself reading Dante's Inferno, you'll see that Guy is in the seventh circle of hell, bobbing about in a river of boiling blood. I've always wondered why he was only included and not his brother too, but either way, something tells me Simon wouldn't have exactly been proud of that sort of infamy. Actually, if you're a fan of fiction reading, I highly recommend Sharon K. Penman's Falls the Shadow, because not only is it wonderfully written, but her research is impeccable, and to be quite honest, it made me cry. Simon was the first man to seize power from the King of England and act as a de facto ruler for any significant length of time. He was the first to call a representational parliament and to fight to limit the power of the king. We'll never know what Simon thinks about how representational government has developed, but something tells me he wouldn't mind being considered one of its fathers. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to check out our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast. You can also like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Join us next week when we'll be talking about how an angsty 18th century German novel changed the face of European youth culture. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.